Okay, in this lecture, we will describe the gross structure of the skull and define its purposes as protector of the brain and support for the special senses. We will identify several of the major features or landmarks of the skull, which will help you locate and identify the bones of the cranium and face. And finally, we will locate and identify the A bones of the cranium. So let's get started. Your skull is the bony structure that forms your head. Now for reference sake, and so we are on the same page as we proceed through this section, this is a frontal view. If we then rotate the skull 90 degrees, then we have a lateral or side view. Now your skull is effectively divided into two distinct sections, cranium here and the face here. If we remove the cranial covering, the calvaria or skull cap, then we can look inside and see the brain. And therein lies one of the purposes of the skull, to surround and protect your brain. Now if we get rid of the brain, no disrespect to your brain of course, as we will revisit it a little later, then we can look into the brain case. That's the space in the cranium that houses the brain. Now the head is also where you will find your special senses. You're familiar with vision, hearing, taste, and smell. So the two main purposes of the skull are to surround and protect the brain and to support the structures of the special senses. Let's now quickly review a few gross anatomical features which will help you recognize the bones of the skull. You will use these features later as landmarks to identify various bones. First we have the protuberance. A protuberance is a prominent, usually rounded swelling or lump that sticks out from the surface of the bone. So an example here is the mental protuberance or your chin bone. Process is a projection or an outgrowth of a bone. Now process represents a significant extension to the main body of a bone compared to the protuberance. An example here is the temporal process of the zygomatic bone here that forms this little bridge here that we call the zygomatic arch. More on that later. Then we have the condyle. Condyle is a round prominence at the end of a bone. Now, usually these are parts of joints, so condyles articulate with other bones. So a good example is the condyle or condyloid process or condylar process, all of those terms are good, of the mandible, that's your lower jawbone. And that articulates with a temporal bone to form the temporal mandibular joint or TMJ. We have the suture. Now a suture is a rigid, that is, immovable joint between two or more bones. Good examples here are the coronal suture here, the squamous suture here, and the lambdoid suture here. Now the human organism is by and large symmetrical. That is, what we have on one side of the body, we also have on the other. So we have a right arm and a left arm, a right leg and a left leg, a right lung and a left lung, and so forth. So looking at the head, we can divide the face right down the middle. And so this line represents what we call the midline. Now the midline is an imaginary plane dividing the body into symmetrical halves. And so you can see here, you have a right eye and a left eye, a right ear and a left ear, and so forth. Now that symmetry extends down to the skull as well. So continuing with our look at the gross features of the skull, we have a foramen or foramen. A foramen is an opening in a bone. Now in the skull, nerves, arteries, veins, and other structures pass through foramina. So good examples are the supraorbital foramina here, supraorbital, above the orbit of the eye, the infraorbital foramina here, below the orbit of the eye, and the mental foramina here, the foramina on the chin. Now if we flip the skull over, we can see the king of all foramina, the foramen magnum here. And so based on its size and location on the floor of the skull, perhaps you can guess what that big hole is for. Now recall that the skull is divided into the cranium and the face, and there are eight cranial bones, and there are 14 facial bones. So now let's locate and identify the cranial bones. So the acranial bones are the frontal, the parietal, and you'll notice that I have there paired. That means there are two parietal bones, one on the left and one on the right, whereas the frontal bone is a single or unpaired bone. The occipital bone, which is unpaired. The temporal bone, which is another paired bone. Then there's the sphenoid bone, that's a single bone, and for the most part, that bone is on the inner part of the skull and the ethmoid bone, that's a single bone also on the inner part of the skull. So the frontal bone, seen here in green. 
Frontal bone is a large, prominent bone at the front of the skull. It's a single bone, as I've said. It forms the forehead and the brow ridge, including the upper parts of the orbits of the eyes. And don't forget the landmarks of the supraorbital foramina. Now, if we turn the skull 90 degrees and look at the lateral aspect, we can clearly see the coronal suture here that joins the frontal bone to the parietal bones. Coronal suture is so called because it crosses the crown of the head or the skull. Now the parietal bone comes from the Latin meaning wall, and this large paired bone forms the roof and the sides of the cranium. Looking at the superior aspect, we can see the left and right parietal bones joined together at the sagittal suture here. The occipital bone is located at the very back of the cranium. It's kind of saucer shaped. Now if we turn the skull up so that we're looking at it from underneath, or looking at the inferior aspect, we can see that the occipital bone forms the base of the skull. And rotating a little bit further, we can easily identify the foramen magnum. Looking at the posterior aspect of the skull, we can see the extensive size of the occipital bone. And the occipital bone is connected to the parietal bones at the lambdoid suture shown here. Now going back to the lateral view of the skull, we can clearly see the temporal bone. This is again a paired bone and the temporals form your right and left temples. The temporal bones also house the organs of hearing, and so we can see the external auditory meatus, or the outer opening of the ear. Other distinguishing identifying features of the temporal bone include the squamous suture that connects the temporal bone to the parietal bones above it, the styloid process here, which serves as an attachment point for various tendons and ligaments, and the zygomatic process, which joins the zygomatic bone, which is a facial bone, to form the zygomatic arch that I made mention of earlier. Now, the zygomatic arch is that little bridge between the face and the cranium, and you can see it a little better in this view. Now we have the sphenoid bone. The sphenoid bone is a single, unpaired bone. It's located anterior to the temporal bones. The sphenoid bone takes the shape of a bat with outstretched wings, and we'll see that a little better in a minute. Now the sphenoid bone is centrally located, but stretches from one side of the cranium to the other, thus forming part of the floor of the cranium, and it helps strengthen the sides of the cranium as well. Now if we jump back to the frontal view, we can see the sphenoid bone in the back of the orbits of the eyes. And in fact, that is one of the functions of the sphenoid bone. It helps form the orbits of the eyes. Now, if we extract the sphenoid bone whole, we can see that bat shape much better. Note here the greater wings, here and here, and the lesser wings, here and here. Now, if we look just inside the orbits of the eyes, we will see the orbital plate of the ethmoid bone, our final cranial bone. The ethmoid bone is a single bone, it forms the medial aspect of the eye socket. That's the orbital plate that we see here. Now if we zoom out a bit, we can see the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone here, which forms the posterior aspect of the nasal septum. Now if we extract the ethmoid bone like we did with the sphenoid bone, then we can clearly see the perpendicular plate here, the orbital plates here and here, and the ethmoid labyrinth, which contains a series of air pockets and chambers that make up the ethmoid sinuses. More on that later. So that wraps up the cranial bones. Now many students make up little mnemonics to help them remember various anatomic structures. So here's one for the cranial bones. If we take the first letter of each of the cranial bones, that is F for frontal, P for parietal, O for occipital, T for temporal, S for sphenoid, and E for ethmoid, we have the little mnemonic, find people on the southeast. Find people on the southeast, frontal, parietal, occipital, temporal, sphenoid, ethmoid. Now, in our next lecture, we will continue the study of the skull as we locate and identify the 14 bones of the face. See you then.